not going to introduce Dr. Jagdish Shet, not that I should introduce Dr. Ben Konsinski <laughs> either. Also. Neither of them need introduction. However, I'm going to quickly introduce Dr. Ben Konsinski because even if one person in this audience doesn't know who he is, they should get to know him. Uh, I had the audacity when I was an assistant professor back in long time back at Georgia Tech to, in 1990, I believe, when Dr. Ben Konsinski was a professor at Harvard Business School, and he was the co-chair or chair for a major conference, international conference on information systems. And I was a young 27-year-old assistant professor uh, asking him for an appointment, and he was gracious enough to give a lunch appointment with us because we wanted to hire him at Georgia Tech as my boss. And my <laughs> dean said, Narsi, you must be crazy. There is no way state school is going to pay matching salary to bring him to Atlanta. But luckily enough, Emory University stepped up to the plate and made sure he ended up here. He is the authority when it comes to uh, uh, IT research and uh, even his uh, consulting alone, the number of boards he serves on, number of companies he advises, large and small, all, all the way through the spectrum, it's truly amazing. You know, sometimes it's okay to find somebody who is exceptionally good as an academic publisher, not that many in IT, by the way, and uh, he has set a trend in that one, making it phenomenal. That itself is phenomenal. In addition to that, um, his consulting as well as service. You know, today, for example, these two gentlemen, they had busy schedule today, especially Dr. Ben Konsinski, he was like, you know, sometimes you feel he was giving up a wonderful networking with his executive MBA students or whatever it is there to come and spend time here with us. And the hook was Dr. Jigdish Shade. Since he is there, Ben said, I have to come there. And with that introduction, let me welcome Dr. Ben Konsinski and let him take over and run with it. Sure. Well, good evening. I uh, want, want to thank uh, Feng and, uh, and Kettering for uh, the creation and, and uh, facilitation of this event. And uh, clearly, uh, I also need to shout out to the SOBs, uh, students of Ben that are in the audience here. I see Rakesh and uh, Jerry and Bjarke and uh, other folks. So I'm always happy to see uh, SOBs uh, in, the, uh, in the audience as well. And I certainly want to uh, reach out and thank uh, UPS for uh, uh, affording this uh, fantastic venue for this event. And uh, some of you know that uh, one of my loves is UPS. And uh, as a company, I, I, you cannot not love a company that has moves 7% of the US GDP on a daily basis and has such extraordinary knowledge about commerce, commerce practice, and commerce motion, and uh, information around it, and still is highly protective and respective of that information and uses it for operational practices and others when, when the natural uh, uh, input from a, a lot of folks is, is to exercise and exploit. Uh, uh, this company starts with uh, service and I've always ad admired that through the years in, in looking at their extraordinary national and international growth and I, I appreciate them hosting uh, this, this venue. But uh, I, um, we're here to, to listen to uh, the, our guru tonight, oh, uh, uh, my good friend uh, Jag Shat. Now, when in the 1970s, both Jag and I grew up in many ways with the telecom marketplace. We both spent a lot of time through the evolutionary practice of, uh, of the evolving data communications marketplace, especially from the Carter phone decision and the D data access arrangements and so forth in the 70s. And we both worked a lot with uh, a company we, we admired at the time, uh, that uh, AT&T. And this was under uh, John DeButz and, uh, and uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie Brown as, uh, as CEO. <coughs> And we spent a lot of time, and I, I was at, at Harvard Business School, and doing uh, my consulting uh, focus, I always try to find a focus venue for a lot of that activity so you can get in depth in helping an, an entity. And I spent a lot of time in all different aspects of AT&T, 
everywhere I'd go, they would, they would welcome me, thank you. And do you know Dr. Sheth? Uh, he was just here. And he's a, he's a genius at marketing. And then I'd go to another venue and they'd say, uh, they would welcome me, it's great to, to, uh, to meet you. And I'm sure you must know Dr. Jaglish uh, Sheth from, uh, from USC. He's a genius on strategy. And I kept hearing this over and over, strategy, marketing, global. Uh, I figured something must be wrong, or there must be five of these guys, or, uh, because I had not met him in person. And so finally, it turned out that um, in, uh, <clears throat> after the scenario Narsi was talking about, I came down and joined uh, the faculty at Emory uh, Business School and found out, guess who came one month before me again? <laughs> uh, Jeb Shad. And uh, <clears throat> we both uh, got to uh, enjoy and uh, I, I believe certainly influence aspects of product and marketing services and the evolution of that volatile marketplace of, of uh, telecommunications, especially in the data communication side, but we've also had many other venues that we've, uh, we've worked in. But uh, no one, uh, I admire no uh, colleague more uh, than Jack Sheth, and both on an intellectual basis and humanitarian. And uh, so I wanna make sure that we cover a, uh, a broad spectrum of uh, elements today because uh, I, I think he has so much to offer us in so many perspectives. And so I'd like to offer a few questions in, in a uh, chat and discussion with uh, Jag. And also, uh, I think we invite you, if you have some questions, to uh, make note of those as well, if you can, and pass those down, and we'll try to bring a few in before we, um, uh, before we end, uh, end the session today. But I wanted to make sure we covered some of the elements that I know uh, JAG offers some great perspectives. And start with a broad brush looking at uh, demographic changes that, are, uh, uh, that he finds interesting in, uh, in the marketplace and uh, that are shaping the economy, both the domestic and the global environment. JAG? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, we all know that uh, Aging of the population is a very big event. Uh, more and more baby boomers are retiring. It has a huge impact on two industries. As you age, you worry about several things. Two key things are wealth preservation and health preservation. So the healthcare sector is growing faster than the GDP. <coughs> 1980, it was only about 8.5% of the GDP. It is about 13.5%, interestingly, and will cross about 14, 15% by 2020. It has a huge implications on corporations because uh, corporations do take, by contract, either unionized or non-unionized, the healthcare obligations of retirees. So here is General Motors, who designed a employee benefit plans <clears throat> based upon the old industrial model that for one retiree in the factory, you will have eight or nine new young employees who will contribute over time. And you do the actuarial calculation. Today, it's almost the reverse. They are hiring only one new employee because of huge automation, robotics, and there are seven or eight retirees. Therefore, there's only one consequence which is what has happened in the airline industry, namely you go for chapter 11 protection and renegotiate the contracts. <clears throat> this is happening in every major corporation. It's a question of the mix of the uh, manpower or you know, the human, human talent by and large. It's a massive impact on the healthcare. The healthcare industry has already crossed $2 trillion. And these are interesting statistics that 45% of the cost of healthcare is in saving last one year of life, 45%. And that's very interesting, government is saying, why should we pay for that aging person, or should they, if they are terminally ill, should they be actually be in a nursing home or in a hospital where the costs are so high 
and therefore can they age and die at home? Which creates enormous pressure on the family because the next generation, their children who can take care of them are both uh, working spouses now. The old model that we had where you have one homemaker and one, uh, you know, the breadwinner, those days are gone also, which is creating enormous societal impacts. That's just one area. Similarly, wealth preservation. So you see now the rise of retail wealth management growing, such as Edward Jones, Ameriprise, etc. So it's no longer the wealthy alone or corporate executives uh, whose wealth management can be done by, let's say, JP Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs, etc. It is basically becoming a mass market which is a very interesting change on the wealth management side. So the banks are struggling with that. Because banks are very good about deposits and opening new accounts, but wealth management capabilities, they really don't have insight. And how do you therefore bring that capability into the banking sector? But one of the trends we've noticed, and certainly of late recent surveys of millennial populations right. have shown that uh, surprising to older generations that they find more security in entrepreneurship than in employment with large companies when, when their parents have been uh, uh, faced with uh, lies on pensions, their, their parents have been faced with uh, cutting short careers that had lifelong employment promises, that uh, it's a part of facilitating a perception that areas that historically would have been considered high risk are actually considered more secure yeah. to that youth. No, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I was going to comment that one of the strategies corporations have adopted is to retire you out early, or in your mid-40s to early 50s, they will say goodbye to you. Not because you are not a talented executive or a manager, but because of the future obligations. And it's an actuarial calculation in some ways, which has created that mistrust. It really began with the first major industrial restructuring after the first energy crisis in the 74, 78. Its impact happened in the early 80s. How many of you remember re-engineering the corporation? Remember that's a hot topic, downsizing, right-sizing, and all this stuff? That is where the social contract between a manager especially, let alone the, uh, let's say, unionized factory workers or service workers by and large, was a very key difference. Do you see, uh, uh, from uh, moving to the global environment and the perspective of U.S. domestic versus global environments, is there a more rapid acceleration on these trends in certain parts of the world? I, you've spent a lot of time in many different venues. It's the same situation now uh, uh, in the managerial class, especially even in emerging economies like India, for example, we have a surplus of CEOs, surprisingly. They are actually having more and more centralized approach, more span of attention, more span of management. And the millenniums all over the world have the same view. If you talk to our young graduates, they're saying, how long will you work at this company they say maybe three to four years. And in countries like Singapore, Ben, it's mind boggling. You do all this recruiting, you know, go through hundreds of resumes. You do the interviews for a whole day, hire a bright young person. And within one day, 24 hours, the person says, I'll use he as a generic term. He says, I leave, I just resigned. So exit interview, you ask the question, why? And the answer is, I just don't like it here. Isn't that interesting? Do you have a job? No, mainly because the parents have, they are a yo-yo generation. They have a safety net going back to parents' homes. All affluent countries seem to have that scenario. So they don't have the typical career mindset that I had, for example, when I grew up. You join a company, you will move up into the company, you will retire out of the company, you get your gold, you know, gold watch and ceremony, and you will be a very loyal retiree, better ambassador than you were actually a manager. I mean, Bell System, we had an enormous number of people who were so happy, even after retirement, about the legacy that they had, the experience they got, et cetera. Uh, those days are gone with the next generation. You are so right. There's a, uh, uh, a story of a friend of mine in Hyderabad mm -hmm. said that the, the principle is 
as you go into a building, if you want a new job, push a different button on the elevator <laughs> wow. than you normally do. That's right. And that the jobs are plentiful and perceived available and plentiful, and therefore yeah. there's no perception necessarily that you have to stay long enough to like, like it. It's really interesting that you get this dichotomous world. There's a group of more experienced managers who are looking for work, and these young people are in shortage talent especially in the IT industry, as you know, today the CIO does not control the budget. 45% of all IT spending in the company now is a lot more on mobile platforms, everything other than ERP. ERP is a legacy thing. It has a lot of life, in fact, to do like Y2K phenomenon, uh, but the majority of dollars are going on uh, e-commerce platforms, etc., where the chief marketing officer is actually controlling that IT budget, which also has an enormous impact on the IT industry, which began as a sort of a IT software-centric knowledge has to become more and more domain or a functional knowledge now, which is another thing, which you have done quite a lot yeah. of work, in fact. Uh, before I go further, I've been forgetting to mention Ben has worn one of his best ties today, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That means this is a special occasion for him, okay? I just want you to be aware, which is interesting. The other major change will take a couple of minutes, <coughs> which I think is as massive as anything else. We have four or five demographics all moving at the same time, and which is creating a discontinuity of this nation more than we realized. We have the more and more the growth of the minorities, as we call them, and by 2030 latest, the majority will be a collection of minorities, which is changing our politics, which is changing the party affiliations. I mean, it's a massive impact on the society. We are truly rising or becoming a multicultural society in many ways, which is fascinating, as opposed to typical WASP population, which is the European immigration that really created the nation what it is. It is becoming very different. And some people are very happy about the change, others are very uneasy about the change. So you will see this uh, public acrimony or debates rise more and more as the transition is taking place. Both in the political area, as well as in the neighborhood area, we find this tension still being there pretty much. That's minor. My view is that the biggest change is actually uh, sort of the decline of the middle class. We are now growing population at two extreme classes. So the number or a percent of the population that is below the official poverty level from eight, nine percent has already grown to 12, 13 percent. It'll plateau at about 18 percent roughly, it looks like. And we are growing affluent people quite a lot on the other side, mostly college educated, professional class, dual career income people. They're having enormous success with their income, and from the income, of course, they're able to save, invest into the stock market. So the extremes are rising, which is a key debate right now about income inequality. Not just the CEO salary versus the average salary or the factory worker salary as a comparison, which may be as much as spread as 50 times or more, but I think just as a society, the middle class has been declining steadily from the 80s. Now, its consequences in marketing, we basically say, therefore, if you are a retailer like Sears Roebuck, Montgomery Ward, remember way back when? Or even J.C. Penney now, you anchored everything around growth of the middle class, middle income population. You put your stores accordingly in those neighborhoods, become a national chain like Sears was an undisputed leader, but the whole market has been shifting. So the growth is at the two extreme price points. Just when we thought that the lowest to the highest price point will be about five times then, okay? Mm -hmm. In grocery stores like soups, for example, fruits and vegetables, or in automobiles. Today, price points are at least 15 to 20 times from the lowest price to the highest price product across product categories. But the big, but the, I'm sorry. No, no, please. Yeah, but the biggest change is none of these. Uh, I'm a very strong believer that uh, we have a fundamental change uh, in terms of working women households. The traditional notion of a homemaker and a breadwinner is gone now in terms of a majority of the population. In my generation, even if you're well-educated as a spouse or a wife, 
immediately said, I would rather be a homemaker than a breadwinner. Today, breadwinning by women in a family is a necessity. It's not just a nice thing to do as it used to be. So it is everybody's responsibility. And I find fascinating that 70 to 75% of women with children in the family all have to work to support the family and the family lifestyle, et cetera, which is bringing a major change, namely that what is in shortage in many families is not just income, but also time. Time shift, time scarcity, creating enormous impact in all service industries. Should it be 24-7, like an e-commerce platform versus a grocery store or a department store? So we, we study all that pretty much in marketing. So it's very fascinating. But this change in the family unit is bringing about enormous change in the politics. So you see the next set of candidates now, especially on the Democratic side, if Hillary Clinton gets the nomination, they're all targeting women as major voting power, as we used to talk about minorities as voting power at one time. Fascinating change going through, fundamentally arising from the change in the family structure. And in fact, surprisingly, Ben, there is even a belief system by sociologists that maybe in some parts of this country, the reverse role will happen, where the wife is the breadwinner and husband is a homemaker. In a couple of states in New England, Maine and Vermont, definitely in uh, Seattle area, and maybe Portland, Oregon, that part, you have a larger concentration where we have not only role blurring, which is a key problem right now, we are in that twilight zone. Who does what? But it begins to roll reverse, and this country was primarily founded on a sort of a paternalistic society, Germanic culture in many ways. Now it is beginning to shift, become more and more maternalistic society, which is a key change. So there's a sociological impact, the role of uh, uh, people in the society, et cetera, et cetera. Very fascinating. But you know, while <clears throat> concomitant with those changes on on demographics and the decline of of the middle class structure is the uh, growth and uh, the value shift on uh, the youth associated with ownership. The aspirations are different. The, the aspiration for a house, the aspiration for a car, the aspiration for ownership of assets are, are shifting quite radically. Uh, Professor Sheff himself was thinking of taking Uber this evening to, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yes. uh, to come here because he probably doesn't want to use his Jag, uh, Jag's Jag, so. Yeah. It's so true, I think uh, the notion of ownership, which is the key foundation of a capitalistic society where you have a property ownership of any kind, I think it's going giving way to more renting everything, you know, which is very fascinating. So from a fixed capital family balance sheet, it is becoming more and more a variable expense, you know, uh, which is an interesting. And, uh, and the, with the sensor technologies, the distribution, internet of things, internet of everything, structures, right. we can measure patterns of use. And so it, yeah. uh, the, the ownership was an easy way of measuring uh, control over use. Whereas now we, we can relax that, and right. there are many new ways to, right. and that's gonna transform commerce and, yeah. in so many ways as the, this population evolves. That's his specialty, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, zoom in, and from a global perspective, let's, uh, let's get local for a few minutes okay, sure. here and talk about uh, Atlanta, because so many uh, changes, when, when you and I came here, uh, we were a center of many things, uh, of uh, many communication aspects and uh, uh, broadcast production and facilitation, right. uh, certainly a, a big part of what's going on. But what's happening just in the current venue is tectonic on both uh, automobile and yes. uh, movies. No, I think you're so right. Uh, out of nowhere, Atlanta is becoming the Detroit of the 21st century. And Atlanta does not even know that. Isn't that interesting? So I've been telling about the city government as well as the state government, put a shingle off that we are the automotive capital of the world because automobile industry permanently is shifting toward the south and the southeast. It is no longer Midwest as it began. It's very much like a textile industry 
which began to shift south permanently, and it's going to happen. Germans are leading the way. All four or five major German manufacturers are putting their capacity all in the south, for whatever reason. And the only viable city as a capital, like Akron, Ohio for tires, or Pittsburgh for steel, Detroit for automobile is Atlanta. There is no other city that comes anywhere near in terms of infrastructure to fly in and fly out, in terms of road structure, everything. So Atlanta is becoming, by default, the automotive capital. Watch the trend. Because when an assembler comes to put the plant to assemble, let's say Porsche now, Mercedes-Benz, for example, Volvo, I think we just lost it, but whatever they are, when you have the assembly point, the suppliers have to come in. It's really a supply chain issue in automobile, which is often three, four deep in supply chain, whereas in terms of a selling side, it is only one deep or two deep, like a dealer and a, and a consumer kind of a stuff, you know? So it's very important to understand the multiplier effect of the auto industry, not just in the factory workers, but in the managerial class, as well as, in fact, the clerical, all three types of workforces. So I'm watching that. And as Ben mentioned, which is a very key, again, surprisingly, Atlanta is becoming a, a good, good hubbing place for making movies with all the incentives. And movie studios, once they put their capacity, usually have an exit problem. They cannot get out too quickly. And it's happening, and it's an ecosystem again. If one comes, others have to come kind of a notion. And that creates a whole ecosystem of, well, like Hollywood was created, or in India, the Bollywood that is created in Bombay. And you know, those are really small geographical areas. When you go to Bollywood and you go to Hollywood, they're not all Los Angeles. It's just one part of Los Angeles or one part of Mumbai in, in India, which is very, again, very, so it can be localized further down. I did want to make one more comment. Atlanta is becoming a global hub city. It always was, always being the hub city for Southeast transport, retail, warehousing, everything. Now it is becoming a part of the global architecture. And the industries and the companies that are going to invest here are not going to be as much from Latin America as we thought at one time when we were thinking about the free trade of all Americas that President Reagan had teed up after, uh, I think, President Carter's actually evolution, which is interesting, but now it's Asia-centric. Mark my words, this is the place where the Chinese manufacturers or Chinese companies will put their hubby. This is the place where Indian manufacturers and Indian companies will put their hubby. And it's a, a strategic location because in the cost-cutting mood, you don't want two headquarters for Western Hemisphere, one in the north in New York, New Jersey, or Toronto, one in the south, Miami, or further south. From Atlanta, you can manage the whole Western Hemisphere. Huge economies of scale. And Asian culture generally has been like the Koreans in, uh, let's say, Los Angeles, or the Japanese in Los Angeles, when one company comes, others come because of the cultural affinity, their own food habits, etc., their own school systems, whatever it is, we think therefore Atlanta will become a major hub city. But Atlanta has all the ingredients but has no recipe. It has no recipe, which is fascinating. Now nobody says this is what we want to be, which is incredible. And we have been sort of struggling with that for at least 20, 25 years that I know, you know, pretty much. Certainly uh, lacking an acknowledged aspiration or right. um, a direction that yeah, it influences exactly. being buffeted by winds right. instead of um, uh, exercising leadership on that. When you look at, uh, we, are, we are 10 years and two weeks from the first uh, YouTube video. Wow. We are nine years, from, nine years ago, uh, Facebook shifted over from schools when only you and I and the students could be on, on Facebook to the, the broad public. The, we're nine years away from the beginning of Twitter that uh, uh, opened up the, uh, and other venues that associated with transformation moving to customer generated content and uh, uh, consumer generated content that changed production away from institutional production into social production. And how has that uh, uh, influenced uh, your sense and perspective on uh, 
market relationship management and transformation? Oh, I think it's transformative. The most disruption of the traditional marketing function, I'm not about selling even, which is a separate, just marketing function suddenly changes. You know, marketing was always, you buy the raw materials, you do value add in your place, whatever it is, and then you sell it in the marketplace. It is basically product forward into the market with e-commerce platform and social media, it is you begin there, therefore marketing becomes more a supply chain management. Isn't that interesting? What we thought was true at Cisco Systems or at Dell Computers is now a reality for every, every major uh, direct supplier, either a retailer or a manufacturer who goes direct to the consumer essentially, is mind-boggling change. I also believe that uh, the, 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 the transformation is that, you know, we, in marketing we always say you are the branch tour. Make sure your brand is consistent, integrated communication, all this stuff. But today the consumer will take all the liberty with your brand, which is interesting. And they will use every technology imagination to manipulate the brand, they want it. So brand manager has lost control of the brand, whether they like it or not. So how do you manage in that environment? Can you do something like Frito-Lay does, you know, where he says, all right, for Super Bowl commercials, let there be a crowdsourcing, which is so inexpensive. Today, gadgets are very good quality at very affordable prices. Everybody can have a great digital, you know, capability or a video digital capability. And therefore, you select, that means, what's the role of the ad agency? Pricing is dynamic now. So all four P's of marketing, you know, product, mm -hmm. <laughs> promotion, uh, place, and, uh, you know, uh, price, are totally changing with this new paradigm. But I did want to talk about something else related to social media. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work before the internet days. I worried about the rise of these information highways on the impact in the society. Every technology is like a potent drug has great benefit for whatever disease or whatever this problem we want to solve, but may have also strong side effects. And I think this technology is probably more transformative than the locomotive, for example, or any other, or television, or telephone for that matter. I think this is more transformative and has more potent side effects. I've been watching that. In fact, uh, I've been almost articulating six, seven side effects, but the biggest ones are the two. First one is that it's very addictive. And therefore, there will be some policy aspects that will come in to say, this is a national problem now. Uh, there was a study done, I just heard it on the local television, surprisingly, that in Canada they found that the young people's span of attention based upon brain research or however they did it, is only eight seconds. They cannot keep attention more than eight seconds. And the punchline was that the goldfish has a nine second attention span. <laughs> Mind boggling, you know, it's interesting. So addiction, and this is addiction of mind. We have very good psychiatry maybe about the addiction of the body, you know, physical bodies, or like, you know, coffee addiction or alcohol addiction. We probably know a little more but the addiction with the mind, we still have, uh, psychiatry is still not there. It's very primitive as yet, because we, it's a discovery process. You know, we ba barely understand uh, mental diseases, for example. People still don't know how to intervene on gambling, which is a major addiction in many societies. But this addiction is the one that we are now monitoring to say, what happens when a large population becomes addicted? How does it change? Uh, uh, relational behavior in some fashion, but how does it change the society? And the second one is one that I've been doing a lot of work, which is the intellectual property rights. Long, long ago, I concluded that when the world goes from analog to digital, there is no way that you can have the traditional patent-based regiment to protect your IP rights. And most law firms only know how to do that thing. Just to give you a size of the whole thing. Today I can take things from the internet, and I could show you one app even now, surprisingly, by a very interesting young man 
who creates, actually I can create on my mobile phone a complete book on me within about three minutes. Everything picked up from the internet. Everything that I have done, which is on the internet, can be picked up and the, the whole software creates a complete book, which I can then edit very quickly. But here is the thing. In the entertainment industry, you have the producer who takes the risk, organizes, you are the director, you are the actor, actresses. But today I don't have to do anything. I can sit behind either a Mac architecture, which is you know Apple uh, for, for entertainment industry, uh, you know, special effects and all the stuff that they do, or I can take Sony architecture. Those are the two fundamental platforms, hardware and software. I can sit in front of a screen and pick up things and I can create my own movie at less than half a million dollars, as good a quality as any documentary or even better. And who has the rights? Nobody has the rights. It is almost like a chef in a restaurant where you have the brand name of a sugar called Domino's or a brand name of a salt called Norton or whatever ingredients he used, they all lose their identity. It is his or her recipe that has an identity now, which is interesting. So all of a sudden, I can come out with, therefore we are looking at the whole impact on the entertainment industry, whether the traditional way of making movies and the traditional way of distributing movies is the future or not. Or wasn't there Blair's Witch a movie, you remember? Mm -hmm. Blair's Witch, I think, was made under four or five million dollars. You know, I mean, all done pretty much, almost like, you know, it's like Michael Moore type movies. Have you seen those? I mean, Michael Moore is fantastic in terms of organizing a theme, creating movie. Most of that is just public information. You can pick and choose. So who is the editor? Who is the director? Who is the screenplay? We don't know. So but intellectual property rights will have to be redefined probably by policy. I'm sorry. Uh, no, Long uh, answer, I'm so no, sorry. No, 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 a part of that is the, uh, the, the valuation. When we look at, at building networks like the internet, the only people that made money on building the internet were the routers and facilitators, but that gets into commodity very quickly. Right. So around 1995, uh, Bill, uh, everyone started talking about content as king, and Bill Gates went around um, buying uh, rights to digital digital image rights for museums. And uh, at, but at that time, and I would mark '95 as a t uh, 20 years ago, that that the uh, uh, enterprise and business community discovered the internet and tried to effectively leverage it to the point where Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates's book on the, uh, the road ahead um, had one chapter on commerce and chapter seven. And by the end of the year, they bet the company on that. You also had the uh, uh, Netscape IPO. And if you look at any one of the successful valuations and IPOs, they're not content creators or content owners. With if you Netscape, Google, Yahoo, uh, Craigslist, uh, eBay, uh, Amazon, very uh, very little of what they do is creation of content, and so it amplifies your your yeah. issue. And this is a uh, context provision creates the value in those uh, in today's markets. Mm. Well, I think it's very fascinating. I think by the time we are through with. Uh, our lives, uh, this is, will be, if you reflect back, I mean, as Ben said, who would have imagined from 2001, you'll have companies like Facebook and Google and all those things just came in the new millennium. And nobody thought about companies like that existing at valuations that they command, and it is not limited to America, please. I must tell you, the largest market for the digital technology is going to be Asia. Uh, ben and I both worked on cellular telephone evolution in this country. I was with Bell Labs and a, I think it was a law firm in Chicago, you know, I forget the name. And then that's where we were working about how to commercialize it. And all the outside consultants had uh, gave us a recommendation in 84, 85 that the largest market for cellular telephone by year 2000 will be about 950,000 subscribers. I, I remember that. They were slightly off. Slightly off. By a few billions, right? Or rounding <laughs> uh, interesting. 
And the largest market for cell phone is China. Second largest in India. India is growing almost like 20, 25 million net new subscribers a month, which is almost creating one of those baby bell wireless technology companies at the time of, you know, but it's very interesting to watch how much, and that's where Alibaba is coming. Don't underestimate Alibaba. If we think we have giant platforms like Amazon, we have not seen anything yet. And they are not likely to come here as yet. Like the Huawei Technologies, which is number one now in telecom gear, surpassing Alcatel, Lucent, Merger, or even Ericsson, very large player in the world, or Siemens, et cetera, it is now number one. They start in China, which is a huge market. How are they do it? Then they go to other emerging economies like Africa, then they come to the advanced countries, which is a very different cycle. And these guys are massive in their scale and size compared to what we thought we were. So we are watching trends, especially from Asia, especially from China, to some extent from India. India has its e-commerce. <laughs> Flipkart is one of those names you might hear. Valuation, have you seen this mind-boggling valuation, just like here? So it's growing much faster in India and India does not even have the supply chain infrastructure properly, but you can have people on motorcycles, scooters go and deliver. Labor is cheap as yet so far. So it's very fascinating how in a, sort of a uh, diverse uh, infrastructure, they're able to improvise and still deliver e-commerce platforms. And we're waiting the drones to uh, went drones, uh, exactly to right, do correct. a lot of that as well. While, you're, uh, while we're referencing India and China, the dynamics between India and China and the, di and the reflection on the global right. marketplace is uh, profound. Yes. And uh, both in, uh, in the, the uh, uh, relationship between those two entities, but also the amplified signals to the world economy. I think so, you know, about 2003, 2004, I started a policy institute called India-China America Institute. I think it's the trilateral relationship that's going to be very interesting. And the US and China are becoming divergent in their views, their philosophies, almost rivaling with each other. India and US are partnering now. All historical things are set aside, especially in the defense industry. But China and India are also getting together. Last week you saw the Indian Prime Minister go to China, it is very historic. Behind the scenes, there'll be a lot more cooperation. Trade will grow enormously, but Chinese investment will come in India, despite all of the hesitations on both sides, it's very massive. Lenovo is number one in PC business worldwide, but number one in India, not just China. <coughs> Huawei Technologies is coming. Alibaba is just making noises that they would like to start e-commerce. Every major hire in appliances would like to compete in the Indian market against the Koreans, like the LG and the Samsung brand of washing machines, refrigerators, etc., and also compete against uh, Electrolux or Whirlpool from here, etc. India is becoming a battleground and it's a big enough market for the Asian manufacturers, mostly Chinese, coming in a big way. How many have you heard of a Xiaomi as a new cell phone maker? Mind-boggling. They offer online only, no retail stores. It is like number two, number three in China, which is a huge market. They've just announced they will even put a factory in India, I think now. So all of a sudden, power is shifting toward Asia and unfortunately, European Union, because of its own issues internally right now, is not able to counterbalance for a while. You know, for a long time, we've taken some comfort in the uh, social and political tensions between India and China, at, at least economically, right. and uh, certainly a perception. I have a cash. Uh, tablets because they are politically tainted because they had Chinese elements in them. But now China is openly selling quite readily yes. and received well in, uh, yeah. in the China market. So uh, as those tensions, both social, political, and economic, uh, dissipate, uh, it seems to be uh, yeah. creating a whole new dynamic. 
looks that way, right? Yes. What else do you have on your mind? Uh, <laughs> They're going all over the place, right? So. Yeah, we're, we're um, uh, time tripping around uh, a, a variety of things. I wanted to uh, address, and then we'll open up to, uh, uh, to some input from the, uh, from the audience as well. Uh, this uh, changing nature of the CFO certainly is of, of interest to our, our uh, FANG community. We've talked about the CIO and the CMO market uh, issue, and you raise the issue of not only the information, some of those historic CIO elements in the CMO side, but also logistics supply chain being a part of a marketing realm. Uh, but what about the dynamics of the uh, CFO role yeah. shifting? The CFO role has been changing from the late 80s but at a slower pace, now it is ramping up. A typical notion was that you will be a CPA, become a controller, treasurer, then move up to a CFO level. <clears throat> Today, CFO usually is the other way around. Somebody who is absolutely savvy at mergers acquisitions, knows how to do joint ventures, is able to blend all types of capital, not just public equity capital, not just the debt capital on which we all studied and grew up primarily, how do you create weighted average cost of capital, but really discovering sovereign funds, such as Temasek out of Singapore, discovering in fact private equity in a big way, and these private equity people are becoming so large now that they can make a difference, as opposed to pension plan like the CalPERS, you know, which is the California, uh, employee union, you know, and their, their, their money, or TIAF, which is mostly academic uh, people's professors' money, you know, for retirement. I think those were the market makers in terms of uh, where they invested, what were the policies, you know, like apartheid policy, we had boycott that, today's sustainability. I think those issues are minor compared to access to alternate capitals. I see another change that the CFO today has to shop around for the capital on a worldwide basis. Not just for large enterprises like UPS, which makes sense. And in fact, I've even advocated that who says that you have to have primarily your stocks and the markets, you know, trading just on one stock exchange. New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ around here or wherever your country of origin is, that you should be comfortable having your stocks, not as ADR, you know, the, 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 the alternate things, but really truly uh, sort of traded in multiple uh, markets. And the last comment I will make is that like everything else, uh, I mark my words, Shanghai will become the largest capital market city in the world, will surpass both London and New York. Remember, 50, 60 years ago, nobody thought New York will surpass London. Today, capitals are all shifting towards Singapore, Shanghai. So unless you know how to access capital markets in Shanghai, you have no idea where the capital market efficiencies are, which is a major change. The other part of CFO job, which I sit on the board of a public large company, and therefore we struggle with as board members asking CFO the questions is the currency issues. Next set of trade wars, will not be trade, such as duties, et cetera, because WTO now is the sort of the watchdog and a sort of the arbitrator about uh, all the trade issues. It'll be mostly currency wars. Currency wars will be rising from now onwards. Uh, the decline of the European Euro is not market driven. It is intentionally intervention by the central governments or a group of central banks, I'm sorry. So also whether the smartest nation in the world on betting on those currencies in the right direction and making money, again, are the Chinese. Chinese, when Euro came out, bet at a price and they knew how much it will appreciate, they must be market makers. So again, currency hedging is a very key issue and nobody knows how to hedge the currencies properly anymore. Uh, given that we are really in a multi-currency regiment. And my last comment is that I think the raw materials such as oil will probably distance itself from being uh, 
dollar denomination pricing. Just like we distance from the British pound at one time, which was the denomination for your information, for world trade, for everything. You have the London Metal Exchange, London Tea Exchange, everything was around, you know, British pound. British pound is gone, it's now American dollar, but we I already see that shift that it'll be probably multi-currency trading that'll happen, which, is a, which means the hedging and the currency fluctuations uh, understanding will be very critical, which is the new role of the CFO mm -hmm. in many ways, or CFO organization. There, there are several questions that uh, arose from the audience related to issues of global transportation and te transportation technology supply chain uh, issues and uh, driverless vehicles and other yes, factors sir. like that. Uh, can you speak to uh, macro shifts, domestic and international too, and where you like, where you expect to see uh, some of the uh, emergent uh, yeah. uh, impacts? Uh, in all the traditional infrastructures, highways to uh, power grids to railways, the key immediate thing is to make them smarter and smarter by embedding digital technologies into them, like sensors, uh, control, monitor, uh, you know, processing, however we do. The biggest change, surprisingly, will be in the automobile first and highway second. Automobiles is the one place that I know, even though I'm not an engineer, I can integrate first time both the telephone technology, which is switching, and the other one would be the uh, IT technology. So far, they are parallel in many places. Convergence we are talking about is still not there, but I can now have a small mini box. Remember in the old days, we used to have a VCR, uh, you know, in, in the trunk of the car, remember? To play the uh, DVDs primarily, small portable. Now it is built into the dashboard. Very interestingly, I can make a device like that, and that device would be under $1,000. Think about the numbers. So I don't need a central office switch of a telephone company. And I can have my automobile become my mobile base station as the world goes toward mobility platforms as opposed to landline on the telephone side for carrying traffic, except the back office, you know, big hall traffic is still fiber optics, so et cetera. But I can make that car as my mobile base station, so I don't need these towers tall where I put my electronics for having cellular technology move. It's today possible. <coughs> In the automobile is the first place where you see voice, video, and data integration. Today it's disparate. I mean, largest cost in building automobile today is electronics, not steel. And they have all everything there, but it's never integrated into a network and connected to the outside world. And some people, Ben, are even saying that I can make that not only just a relay mechanism, which is really uh, base stations, but also I can make a dynamic network. You know, which yeah. is fascinating. An automobile means uh, two-wheeler, which is a bicycle, you know, and then the motorcycles is a very large market, interestingly. So that's a transformative. Yeah, so aspect. we have yeah. hundreds of sensors in, in our cars that right. don't communicate, cooperate. Exactly. If you start yeah, turning the dial of cooperation, uh, even modestly, right. new things are possible, parking, collision avoidance, right. and other. Yeah and we start turning that more. That's the entity itself right. contained and uh, decision rights and authorities are shifting within the vehicle, that captive area. And what, what happens when you start getting the social system of devices and the highway itself changing. I, I also expect that the uh, transportation, uh, the, the long haul vehicles yeah. are gonna be a strong venue here as well. Uh, certainly, we, our, our future of human driver vehicles for long haul transport are uh, diminishing uh, this, this, right. uh, as a career structure and uh, it's a very attractive domain for uh, hauling stuff as well as hauling people uh, as that moves along. So we can certainly see a lot more uh, uh, change. Other thoughts on transportation infrastructure from the global uh, supply chain arena? 
I think for global, there are two, maybe three different trends we see. One is that more and more air cargo is becoming uh, more affordable, more possible. People are used to paying prices for the speed of delivery. So clearly we see shifting from the traditional railway shipping, etc., to more and more air. All flowers now are shipped out. You know, semiconductors, they are shipped out now. Books are shipped out, for example. You know, it's very fascinating how even bulky products are coming by air now for whatever reason. Not only UPS has a largest air fleet, uh, but even the commercial uh, carriers uh, have enough capacity in their belly, you know, besides the passenger to carry cargo. So that's clearly one. The other one is that we really don't have truly integration in multimode transport, even today. There are hiccups. And I think the friction there, technology will solve that quite a lot, just like we have done in e-commerce. So supply chain will get very much impacted by the IT technology and make it as smooth as possible. Uh, so the same cargo, in fact, it was already done. There was a company called American President Lines, you might remember as a name. And I remember going to their office in uh, uh, Oakland, California, I think, you know. And the CEO chairman had a huge panel. They were container cargo shipping companies, my memory. So he was very proud. This is the legacy days of the computers, mainframe computer days. Think about what we can do today. You know, and he said, look, I have in my container cargo, like the limited, which is a fashion industry, uh, clothing, or Toyota parts. RFID was still not there as yet, surprisingly. But I have a tag which can now tell which cargo is belonging, which SKU in which container, and I can make that into a multimode, a seamless transition, which is fascinating. So, so I think that in many ways, uh, now today, we can Im improve that enormously by a magnitude. So clearly that's one that I see. Yeah. The other one is the regulatory regime. As global tra tra transport goes from border to border, and we have all the security issues, just as we have at the airports with passengers, I think cargo is immediately having the same issues. So companies like UPS, et cetera, are really behind the scenes able to understand the whole notion of uh, cross-border cargo transport from a regulatory compliance and uh, security issues. Yeah, uh, and certainly visibility and multimodal visibility, uh, at least modal independent visibility, okay. is a part of some of these patterns of innovation. I also okay. see a shift towards uh, the local, the, the uh, same day yeah. uh, local right. proximity delivery and distribution becoming a, a, uh, a sandbox of innovation Absolutely. Uh, in these domains. Uh, do, you see, do you see uh, drones in that local delivery? Uh, they're going to play a, a role, certainly. The, the rural domains are, are, uh, are very appealing notions for that. Your, your um, um, pile of uh, broken motorcycles and bicycles delivery replacement, especially for medicines right. that need to be moved in uh, yeah. geographic distances. I see it less in the uh, uh, metropolitan dense area initially than, than in the rural domains. And the jurisdiction will be by FAA or by a local who has a territory space, uh, airspace? Who do you think will control? Well, we're at a, we have a constant battle and I've <laughs> yes. dealt with the the military has always said that they're, they're, in the military side, there's a battle between the Army and the Air Force, but uh, between the Air, Army wants to look over the hill and the Air Force wants to position a global right. hawk and take two hours to look over the hill. And uh, so there's a battle going on there as to how much they can leverage space. But uh, they both have uh, a stronger uh, uh, challenge not in a war zone or not even over friendly uh, uh, allied territories, but in their own country. I have one more uh, question for you, Ben. <laughs> you know, we were all so surprised that out of nowhere, a company we never associate would be the lead in cloud computing. 
six, seven years ago, that was Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, not IBM, not IBM's, you know, uh, competitors or any of the IT services traditionally, you know, that we thought would be the one who will move to, it was Amazon. Do you think in the drone business, Amazon may be the lead market maker and create like a de facto standard in well, some fashion about how to do it? Well, the issues associated with uh, uh, managing the air highways have been raised by folks like Amazon. The governance of those, those highways and the control mechanisms are going to change. And okay. I, I, can, I, I can say some things that uh, are radically changing, but uh, a lot of what we see as marketing reaches and marketing uh, uh, exploitations are, are really just that, and uh, certainly not. Until we, we can govern altitude and directions in the highway control, it's gonna be very different uh, in those domains. There, there's a, uh, a question from the audience related to expanding a little bit on this issue of, of the, uh, uh, the sharing economy. We talked a little bit about Uber and, and mm -hmm. uh, this environment. What, what do you see as, as we look at things like Air, Airbnb and Uber? And, uh, we, we've got new, uh, new patterns of association relationship with products and services that are very different from traditional right. exposure and traditional marketing as well. I mean, the, the heuristic that is evolving after watching the success of Airbnb, for example, or the Uber success, is that wherever you have capital dollars, capacity sitting idle, and the justification by the finance organization is that at least for the cost of capital, we are getting our return, whether it's a factory, or whether it's a, you know, a moving object like an automobile, or whatever it is, uh, you will see more and more sharing of that capacity. Because the marginal cost of sharing that capacity, giving up ownership, proprietariness, need for my own use, is probably not as, as a strategic as we thought. And, so, and ownership is not as correct. Uh, valuable as it was. Exactly right. So you will have these intermediaries who will come in to say, you all have idle capacities, I can show you a more efficient model by aggregating and sharing that capacity as a middleman or a middle person. And I think that is very likely. It happened in the printing business where the, let's say, newspapers may own the printing press capacity, but it was only done for the daily run. The rest of the time it's idle, so they began to share with each other. And with digital technology, I can send my magazine digitized, but if I want a print copy, it'll be a local printing press who has an offset print press, and you begin to share that again. You know, what was a dedicated capacity begins to now, is wherever my view is that there's a capital dollars, stranded asset essentially, uh, and can be liberated through this mechanism, you will see more opportunity. If you're an entrepreneur, I would use that as heuristic and say, what Uber did, what Air to, Air B2B did, there are plenty of opportunities here. Asset management, asset exercise, yeah. and event control, event management, yeah. Yeah. allow you, untether you in so I many so. ways in, in thinking about new commerce. I'm gonna get, move into a lightning round because we, we have a few quick questions and a, just a few more, uh, more minutes here. But one, one question was about uh, Bitcoin and uh, uh, extra sovereign uh, uh, did, yes. uh, cyber currencies. Yeah. Uh, as well. Do you have any uh, thoughts and comments? No, I'm not an expert, but I can tell you my view <laughs> as an observer and understanding, interestingly, is that it's like the drone issue. Governments will not allow it to happen. Even can, though it's very possible. Can they, they stop it? Huh. Interestingly, no, it cannot be stopped because currency as a medium of exchange, there are two values of a currency, storage value, and, and an exchange value. Exchange value, bitcoins can create. Storage value, I don't think so. This is where the early investors in bitcoin have all lost money. Which means appreciation of that currency over time or valuation of that one for asset exchange, like we do with money for house, etc. that is not likely to happen. And storage-wise, it's not gonna happen. Wealth 
aspect. But uh, transaction, it might happen. The problem with transactions right now is that there is such an inefficient system, personally. Just today, I had to send a wire transfer out. Interestingly, it's painful process in this country. Our banks really are not swift or no swift, are not really, really organized to do. Transaction cost is also very high. So you have both inefficiency and transaction cost coming in play to say there has to be an alternative. If the governments don't create that, if the interbanking system doesn't create that, somebody will find an alternative to that, you know? So long as it's an acceptance of that. So we have this uh, cryptocurrency possibilities, and you look at 200 years ago where you would have municipalities that would create their own currencies, and they weren't all based on the sovereign state structure. Right, right. Can we move back to the, that independent, sometimes piratical uh, structure with cryptocurrencies? In fact, uh, banking began that way. It was an IOU piece by a given banker when there was a lot of, you know, uh, democ democracies were coming in Europe, nobles and kings were fleeing, wealthy people were fleeing, so they wanted to keep their assets like jewelry with some trustworthy person. That led to the banking, and they were right an IOU, which became a banknote. And then we began to sort of create a national currency, you know, by, by jurisdiction. So it's always a possibility. I totally agree. Yes. And uh, the risk is in the retention, the passive side, yeah. the exploitations in the active side, the kinetic, the exactly. doing the exchanges. Right. Right. And that's where, uh, if I, as long as I don't have to have the risk of holding, right. I can take uh, the currency off the trade. Another question comes up about uh, employment and can finding candidates and retaining, finding and retaining. We talked a little bit about the millennials and uh, their structures in there, but what do you see shifting in how we find skill sets, active yeah. skill sets and retain them? Yeah, while we have the millennium issue, which is why, as I said, everything in this country is, on all demographics, the range or the standard deviation is becoming larger and larger and the mean is shrinking, which means average makes no sense by definition. So you see the opposite trend, and I have made public uh, pr sort of writings. The largest single employer in the U.S. by 2020 may be an organization with four million employees, and they don't know how to spell their name so far. So this is beyond manpower, beyond uh, Kelly service. Remember that began in Atlanta for clerical, etc. Beyond staffing right now in IT industries, beyond, you know, uh, part-time accountants and lawyers and all this stuff, which is a staffing essentially. This will be a company, what I call Self Inc. Today, more and more people are simply fed up with corporate America. So they just want to, that social contract notion is gone on both sides now. And they're simply saying, I can put my shingle up and I work as a contractor, not as an employee, because as a contractor, 40 hours is 40 hours, whereas as an exempt employee, there is no limit, 65, 70, who cares? And there's no balance between my personal life, and today lifestyle is such that you don't have a homemaker waiting for you if you are the male, for example. Both are working. So more and more people are opting to simply say, I wanna be by myself, and today with technology, in the basement of my house, and at that age, you are now very capable of starting a home, I mean, office at home. And I have everything going. I have basically a virtual thing, and I will be available sharing again. Mm -hmm. Lot of capacity of experienced, talented people. Again, there will be an intermediary like Air, BT, BNB, kind of a one who will say, I can organize that model. And of course, if one spouse is working, you get all the health benefits. So there's a lot of flexibility arising now in the society about liberating great talent. Either you export them to other countries on a loan basis, because other countries don't have experienced management with the processes and the cultures that we have. I mean, we have great talent, but this country is not able to utilize that. So all of them are becoming, in fact, I've coined a phrase called entrepreneurship by necessity. We thought entrepreneurship was primarily by passion, etc. Now it's a necessity. So people will actually, with experiences of senior people, can easily pick up a chi-chi 
pizza restaurant, 85,000 franchise fee or whatever they charge, and made it into a gold mine running that one location franchise. It's like McDonald's, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, which is an interesting one. So they are all saying, as a managerial class with college education, 20, 30 year work experience, I can be one of those entrepreneurs because I have no other choice. Yeah, uh, employment does not mean employee. Exactly. Yeah, and, um, and which is why, I'm sorry to yeah, please, interrupt there, which is why the current numbers that government gives are not representative. What's work is coming back but the employee is not coming back as much. So unemployment rate will remain high. Employment growth that we are all targeting, Federal you know, Reserve Bank is suggesting how much it should be as, as a way of you know, raising or lowering interest is unfortunately anchored to the old industrial model, which is not the model of the future of worker in the workplace. We're, I've got one more, one more question based on the um, uh, note that was uh, given me as a, as a question, but I, I want to make sure before we leave that we a acknowledge and, uh, and certainly recognize the uh, our general counsel, uh, uh, Srini Srinivasan, uh, here as well. Our, where is the general counsel? So welcome. <clears throat> I'd, uh, one of the, the questions about the explosive pattern of growth that uh, uh, we've seen this rapid pattern of changes going, and we're we're at a growth rate. Uh, we have uh, 3.5 billion people that have uh, our cell phone are uh, uh, mobily connected. Our aspiration for uh, to 2020 is just a half billion more. And that's, uh, that's not necessarily slow growth, but it's a, a different pattern. At the same time, we're dealing with about seven or eight years ago, we, st we had more devices than people in the internet arena. Mm. And explosive growth much more rapid than, than among humans. And that population to 50, an aspiration to 50 billion, let's say, in that same time frame. Mm. How, uh, how does one face that uh, explosive growth pattern and dynamics that accelerate all aspects of commerce and society? Uh, yeah. That's an easy question. <laughs> easy question, <laughs> yes. I'll leave you with that question. <laughs> it's like a quiz in a college classroom, right? So <laughs> interestingly. Um, no, I think you can manage any time an explosive growth by two, three mechanisms. One is to phase in the growth by controlling the supply as Apple did with watch that they just came out. The demand was far greater, they knew they cannot put the capacity in place ahead of the demand. You don't know how the demand will come about. And Ben, I don't know whether you know anybody, but he's absolutely an expert on Apple products. He always has the latest one that he shows me and I'm really in the uh, horse and buggy days, and he's into the space age, you know, kind of, a, we are far apart, so I learned quite a lot from him. So I think one way would be managing like the swatch watch did, you know, control one that you create demand, but in phases to have the supply chain managed. Other one is to diversify your supply chain. Rather than rely on single sourcing place, let's say Taiwan or mainland China for components right now, for Apple, you now begin to put two, three alternative sourcing destinations. And I've been advocating that India may become a second sourcing destination to things made in China, just to de-risk, because you don't know through policy change, China can actually stop the supply function. It's very possible, any country can do it. And given that they have their own national interest, they can easily say, this is a strategic asset. We cannot, it's like rare materials, you know, rare minerals kind of a thing, uh, that therefore we don't want to supply anymore, as we do it quite a lot. So, so I believe that having two, three supply chains, and we have learned that now with earthquake disasters, that relying on a single supply source, the typical cluster model, remember we used to talk about clustering of industry like steel in Pittsburgh, you know, as we, as we talked about. I think now we are debating and saying we should have some distributed capacity for supply chain so that our, we can de-risk the supply function. 
and therefore how do you create several centers of excellence? And a third one is breaking up the supply chain into components. So that different components are different places. Semiconductor industry did that. When I worked at uh, Texas Instruments and Motorola, which was a big semiconductor company, I was amazed that a single semiconductor before we use it, let's say in integrated circuits, you know, or in a PC board, actually travel around the world four or five times. Different steps were done in different parts of the world, which was uh, surprising to me. It's such a lightweight, of course, it's all air shipment. So we probably will break up the value chain in the supply side into different places and manage. That's a very different logistics art uh, architecture. UPS, therefore, has to be impacted in a very different way if this happens on a large scale by several large enterprises. It changes our nature of inventory, our yeah. concepts of right. inventory, assets in motion and assets at rest uh, as well become right. a part of yeah. decision rights in, in commerce. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jag, and I, I think all of you can, can see why I honor and respect uh, Jag and listen to him on um, uh, so many, many dimensions of uh, contribution and on humanity as well, too. So help, help me thank you. Thank you.